said, you know, when my dad writes a poem, he makes like a hundred bucks for it. That's nothing, said the other boys. When my, the next one said, when my boy writes a story, they pay him like 200 bucks for it. The third boy said, that's nothing. When my dad writes a sermon, it takes four people to collect all the money. You know, it's interesting. This morning we're talking about pride. Pride can show up in all sorts of different places and ways and things. I mean, pride can just show up all over the place. And as we talk about pride, I just want to start with a bit of a definition. It'll be up on the screen, pride. Look, look at the word itself. What do you see right in the middle of it? I. And pride is all about I. Me, 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 I, 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 my, my, my. That's Pride. St. Augustine said that pride is a love of one's own excellence. Look at what I've done. Look what I've accomplished. Look at who I am. Look at all these things that I can do. I, 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 me, 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 my, my, my. It's interesting. Pride is, by definition, it's an inflated sense of one's own personal status or accomplishments or importance. I, 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 me, 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 my, my, my. Why don't you say that with me? I, 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 me, 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 my, my, my. That's pride. My, my, my. And pride is interesting because we can have pride in all sorts of things, in the way that we look or the way that we talk or the uh, way that our hair looks this morning or what we drive or where we live or the investments we've made or the talents we have or our kids or other people or things in our team that we cheer for. We can have pride in all sorts of different things. Pride typically wants it all to be about me, though. It all centers back to I, 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 me, 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 and my, my my. Ever run into someone who seemed to have a lot of pride? Somehow they seem to make everything come back to them. You can be telling them this story about how you were in this accident, but the story keeps going back to be about them, and you say, well, wasn't this terrible accident? It was so bad. And then in the end, you spend 20 minutes hearing about how good they look in spandex. You know, and you think, how did this story become about them? I, this was my story. Somehow pride makes it all about us, all about who we are. It's interesting. The Bible warns us again and again against pride. Two of the verses that come to mind for me are uh, from Proverbs 11. It says, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. Another one from Proverbs 16, pride goes before destruction. Or maybe you know a different translation that says, uh, pride comes before the fall. It's interesting, the Bible, it's quite concerned about pride, that we don't have too much pride about who we are or what we do let me ask you this. What was the first sin recorded in the Bible? Good guess would be pride. Uh, it is pride. We hear about it in Ezekiel, not Adam and Eve, but actually of the devil, of Satan himself. And this is what it says in Ezekiel. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. The devil was guilty of pride, about who he was, about what he could accomplish, about uh, how great he looked even his own splendor that says that it corrupted his wisdom. He couldn't even think straight. He was so proud of himself. First sin in the Bible, pride. If you look at Adam and Eve, I think you say that they were guilty of some pride. You know, we do deserve that fruit. God is keeping something from us. Why is he holding this back? We, we do want to be just like God. We deserve that. I, 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 me, 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 my, 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 I want that fruit. Pride comes before the fall. We see it come true there again. You know, the very next story, Cain and Abel, they both go off and make their offerings, their sacrifices, and it says that God found that Abel's was pleasing, but it wasn't, Cain's wasn't, and Cain, I think, could be guilty of pride. Why did God like his sacrifice instead of mine? My sacrifice was really good. Why is my brother always stealing the spotlight? I got to get rid of this guy. And so he kills him. Pride just keeps on showing up again and again and again and again in the Bible. You know, pride gets to Christians too. It's amazing to think about uh, one of the stories that comes to mind is the story of Peter. Uh, Peter the disciple. Peter had a lot of good things going for him. He's a married man. He's got this fishing family, fishing business. And they've employed, they have at least four staff that we know of working for this business. And then he gets called by Jesus. And that was pretty important to be called up as a disciple to follow a rabbi. Especially Jesus then is so successful and, and so visible 
uh, as he does his ministry. That could be pretty prideful. And then as he goes along, Peter actually becomes one of the inner circle. It's not just the 12 disciples, but uh, Peter's one of the top three, it seems. He gets called by Jesus to these special events and special occasions. And I think that starts to puff Peter up a little bit. I want to read an account for you from the night that Jesus was having the Last Supper with his disciples. Jesus was talking. He said, This very night you will all fall away on account of me. And Peter replied, Even if all others fall away on account of you, I never will. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, This very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And it says all the other disciples said the same thing. I don't care what happens. I will never leave you. I'll never fall away. Even if everyone else does, I never will, Peter says. There's a bit of pride in that, isn't there? I mean, just think Jesus is sitting right there saying, Peter, this is going to happen. And Peter, it seems like he's arguing back, fighting back. Never, Jesus. You, you've been right a lot of times, but this time you're absolutely wrong. That I would never, ever do that. You know how that story ends just hours later. Uh, Peter's denied Jesus three times. The rooster crows, and it says Peter runs outside and weeps because he realizes it was all his pride, that Jesus was right, that even though he had fought so hard saying, I'll never betray you, that he's just gone and done this thing he said he never would. It's pretty amazing to think. I mean, Peter was right there with Jesus, shoulder to shoulder, walking with him, seeing all these miracles, and yet somehow he was able to make it kind of about himself, that he was so important because he was one of the top three disciples, that he would never turn away from Jesus, never betray Jesus. Do you ever get prideful It's not something we talk about very often or think about. I I get prideful often. I've got a beautiful wife, great kids. I've got this minivan. I roll down the windows, pump the music, (laughs) drive around sometimes. You know, really, I, I do get prideful sometimes. I get prideful about my work here, about this church. I get prideful about my sermon sometimes. I last weekend I was away because I was doing a wedding in Medicine Hat for a friend of mine and I did this wedding service, and people just kept coming up to me and saying, that was the best wedding service ever. That was the best sermon I've ever heard. That's so great. Me and my husband were talking about it after service. We agree. We need to work on those things. And I was just kind of getting a little bit puffed up. And then during the groom's uh, speech, uh, during the wedding in front of everybody, uh, during the reception, he, he started talking about how great it was that I was there and how meaningful my message was. And he started to cry as he talked about it, that it was so important to him that I was there and the words that I shared. And He's getting pretty puffed up just sitting there at the table. <laughs> I'm over here. I do this every Sunday. You know what I mean? It's, it's easy to get prideful sometimes, even though the whole point of me being there was to bless them, to have God bless them. It wasn't supposed to be about me at all. It was all supposed to be about God and what God was doing and how God was going to bless them. And yet, it's so easy to just kind of take all of that and make it all about me and how important I am and all the things that I can do. I, 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 me, 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 my, my, my. Isn't it interesting how we can do that? even when we're trying to do something for God or with God, that we can somehow make it all about us. Do you ever get prideful? You know, sometimes pride is fine. It, it, it's okay. Like, like when you go and do something well, like God asks us to do, God tells us that whatever you do, whatever, whatever's going on in your life, do it as if you're doing it for the Lord. And it makes sense that we should take some pride in that. It's okay if someone says, hey, you did a good job, and you think, yeah, I did do a good job. You know, if you, if you feel good about something you've done, that, that's not bad at all. Or it's okay if you have pride in something that your kids have done or that, that your friends have done, and you look at them and say, I'm just so proud of you that you passed that test or you completed swimming lessons or you learned that instrument or whatever it is. I'm, I'm really proud of you. I, I think that's totally fine. I mean, even God says, uh, you know, in Revelation, he'll say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. I think it's okay if we think, Yeah, that is good. But the challenge comes with pride, or or the sin comes when we start to think, yeah, I am really good. You know, that probably was the best sermon ever written, ever. I probably am the very best pastor in the world. When we start comparing, when we start just getting filled up with it, instead of thinking, yeah, God did let me do that. Isn't that awesome? And, And he worked through me. That's really cool. Or when we start looking at our kids and saying, my kid is really smart. 
definitely smartest in the class. Should probably be teaching part of the class. My kid's a real prodigy. I don't know why they're not on TV yet. I think they should run for prime minister. You know what? We can just kind of let it become more and more and more about who we are and about how we must be better than other people than instead of just appreciating that God's at work in and through us and being happy about that. I want to read another Bible account for you, and I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but it's a great section. It's from 2 Chronicles chapter 26, and if you want to write that down or remember it, put it in your iPad or something. It's such a great chapter just to see how pride can unfold in someone's life. 2 Chronicles 26, it's about this young man named Uzziah who becomes king at the age of 16. Uh, it's a pretty amazing situation to be in. So at the age of 16, he becomes king. And it says this, As long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. So there he is, this 16-year-old guy, and he's successful in everything he does. He's successful as a king, successful as a military leader, successful as a political influence in the area. He does all these cool things like he builds towers and he builds catapults and says that he can shoot arrows and shoot huge stones. I mean, it just seems like a really cool and interesting guy. But then it says this. It says, his fame spread far and wide, for he was greatly helped until he became powerful. But after Uzziah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord, his God. See, the more God lifted him up, the more successful he was. And, and then God just kept on lifting him up and making him more and more successful. God kept lifting him up more and more successful. And then Uzziah said, this is all me. Look at everything that I've done. Look at everything I've accomplished. I, 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 me, 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 my, 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 this is all mine. Look at everything that I've done. And the moment God stopped lifting him up, he fell. That's the end of Uzziah's story. He turned away from the Lord, and then he dies. Everything that he has falls apart. It all crumbles. Pride comes before the fall. You know, more literally, that passage says, pride comes before destruction. It's not just talking about pride puffing you up, and then you lose your job, or things don't go well for you, or you know, you fall out of favor with some friends. It's not just talking about some small consequence, but it's talking about destruction, about pride puffing you up so much that you don't think you need God anymore, and you lose your salvation because there's no room left. I don't need God. I'm doing this all on my own. I'm just totally fine on my own. Pride can puff us up so much that there's no room left for God. And that's what happens in Uzziah's story. I have a question for you. How many of you have something like this at home? Some Mr. Clean or some Vim or some, yeah, everyone have something like that? Okay, some of you didn't raise your hands and I'm worried about the cleanliness of your house, but I'm sure that it's fine. I'm sure you got, you're using vinegar or something. Okay, I mean, now, um, any of you, uh, would you agree that this is poisonous? Yeah, okay, this is not good for you to take in, right? How many of you, even though you know that, even though you know that this is poisonous, Let's just be honest. How many of you go home after church and just take a little drink? <laughs> just to jolt yourself awake. Whoa! Any, any of you do that? No, why not? Because it wouldn't taste good. It could clean you out. You got a cold? Mr. Clean. Whoa. No, I mean, you don't do that because you're smart people, right? Yeah. Because it's poisonous. It could kill you, right? I mean, you, you just know, thank you for sharing the obvious. We don't drink it because it's going to kill us, right? How many of you, I mean, you don't go home and drink this stuff because it'll kill you. How many of you watch things that you know are, are not good for you or read things that you know are not good for you or download things that you know aren't good for you? How many of you take in things like lies or affairs or adultery or theft or violence or crime or uh, drugs or all sorts of different things, even if you're just watching it and think, yeah, that's okay. I'm, that's okay for me. I think we do that a lot. And someone said to me after the first service, you know, we can't even really watch the news because it just shows us so much stuff that's not good for me. It, it's poison. It's toxic. And, you know, I think I often think, well, I'm okay, that doesn't bother me. That song, I don't really listen to the lyrics, I just like the beat. 
That show, it's just entertaining, even though they're all having affairs and, you know, people are getting killed. And, you know, I, th I think we take that stuff in and think, well, it's not going to bother me. It doesn't impact me. It doesn't affect me. But isn't there just something wrong? There's, there's a breakdown somewhere where we can watch something that's sinful and find it entertaining. And I'm guilty of that. You know, the shows I watch... I mean, I don't want to make it sound horrible, but they're regular shows, and the regular storyline is an affair, a murder, uh, a lie, a scandal. I mean, isn't that just the storyline of the things that our world produces now? And I watch it and think, oh yeah, that's okay. It doesn't bug me. It doesn't get to me. But why would I take that in if it's, if it's poisonous for me, if it turns me away from God, if it, if it kind of lifts up things that God doesn't like or honor or value? I've told you before, I'm going through a 12-step program called Freedom Sessions. Uh, I go to that every Tuesday night, and about a month ago, maybe a bit longer now, they issued this challenge called the Filth Digestion Challenge. Just to think about how much garbage are you taking in? You know, maybe, maybe it's food that you're taking in, but how much media are you taking in that's just garbage and it's not good for you? How much music are you taking in that's garbage it's not good for you? How, how many books or magazines or websites do you go to that are just not good for you? How much garbage are you taking in? And what would it be like if you just stopped all of that? The challenge was to try it for a week. If you're looking for a Lenten challenge, I'd try the, the filth digestion challenge just to think just objectively about this show I'm about to watch. What's the content going to be? What's the song I'm going to listen to? Well, what's it actually lifting up or encouraging? I think often our pride says, it's going to be okay, but I think God would look and say, why are you doing that? If you know that it's poison, if you know that it's toxic for you. You know, there's this, uh, another passage I want to share with you from Psalm 10. It says this, In his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there's no room for God. You know, the danger with watching those shows or taking in those kind of things isn't that you hear a swear word. Uh, I think you can probably all handle it. It's not that you see a crime and then you become a criminal. I don't think that that's the result. I, I think the danger is just thinking, well, this is okay. This is removed from my life with God. And, and we start removing more and more. And in our pride, we just think that we're responsible for more and more. And we can handle more and more. And we're in charge of more and more. And eventually, there's just kind of nothing left where we think, God, you're in control. And God, I need your leading here. God, I need your guidance here. I think the danger is that we stop clinging to Jesus so tightly and start thinking, oh, Jesus, I'll, I'll get to you later. You know, God, I'll get to sin and get to walking with you some other time. I think the real danger is that we just start thinking, well, I, got, I don't need God anymore. And in our pride, we end up going to a fall, a fall where we're separated from Jesus. I think sometimes we think, well, I'm pretty humble, right? I mean, isn't that one of the things that prideful people say? I'm pretty proud of my humility right now, actually. I'm actually doing a really good job of it. I like this quote from William Law who wrote, there could be no surer proof of a confirmed pride that a belief is one that one is sufficiently humble. I'm humble enough. I'm proud of it too. Pride's just this thing that sneaks in, just gets in there all the time. One of the fascinating things about Jesus is Jesus has absolutely every reason to be proud of himself. Right? I mean, he's God above everything. He's creator of everything. He's perfect in absolutely every single way. No fault, no frailty, no weakness, no downfall. Jesus has absolutely every reason just to be totally focused on himself. And yet as we read through the Bible, that's not at all what we see. What we see is this God who is so humble that he leaves all of that for you and me. We see this God who loves us, who's focused on other people so much that he gives up everything he has so that he can be with you and I, so that he can walk with people, he can listen to people, he can teach people, he can heal people, he can raise people back to life so that he can die for us so that we can be forgiven.
We can have all of our sins washed away. We can be made new. We can be transformed by His Word and by His grace that we can live eternally with Him. He does that all entirely for us. It's not about, not about Him at all. He didn't need more people to worship Him or more people to praise Him. He did it all humbly for us. I mean, it's mind-blowing when you think about it. The absolute most significant being in all of the universe at all time makes Himself humble even dying for us. I'll read a passage for you from Philippians 2. I'm sure that you know this. It says, Being in very nature God, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. God humbles himself, even willing to die for us, and even willing to die in the most excruciating, awful, humiliating way possible because he loves you. We can't earn that. We can't deserve that. You can't buy a love like that. God just gives it to us. It ends this way. It says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus completely humbled himself so that your sins could be forgiven, your life could be transformed, your eternity could be spent with him. That's amazing to think about. As you continue walking with Jesus, as you continue growing as a Christian, I pray that God replaces more and more of our pride with humility, uh, that we look more and more like the humility of Jesus. I don't know what you picture when you think of somebody who's really humble. We don't really promote that a lot in our culture. Be more humble. I don't know. I, I don't pray for my kids that they're super humble. I, maybe I'll start now. But when I think of someone who's humble, I don't think of something really great. And yet I love this passage from C.S. Lewis. He writes this, Do not imagine that if you meet a really humble man, he'll be what most people call humble nowadays. He will not be some sort of greasy, swarmy person who's always telling you that, of course, he is nobody. Probably all you will think about him is that he seems a cheerful, intelligent chap who took a real interest in what you said to him. If you dislike him, it will be because you feel a little envious of anyone who seems to enjoy life so easily. He will not be thinking about humility. He will not be thinking about himself at all. I like that. And as I think about that passage, that he's not thinking about humility, he's not thinking about himself, it reminds me of Jesus. Uh, Jesus came and gave himself for us, and then God fills us with his Holy Spirit and then sends us out to be like Jesus, to, to follow that example that he sets for us. And I, I don't have to walk around and just keep muttering to myself, be more humble, be more humble, be more humble. And try and tell people I'm actually really humble. I'm a very humble person. I don't have to start every conversation that way. What I just need to do is love people. To, to take that mirror that always wants to be focused on me, that I, 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 me, 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 my, 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 and turn it to other people. I think as we try and live out the, those two great commandments that Jesus gave us to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, I mean, that just immediately turns ourselves out to God, doesn't it? And then as we follow the second commandment to love our neighbors as ourselves, doesn't that just immediately, again, turn the mirror away from myself? It's not all about me. It, it's about this God who's given me everything, who's raised me up, who's lifted me up, who's letting me succeed, who's giving me breath after breath, day after day. Isn't that amazing? And that isn't it amazing that he wants to speak through us to the people around us. And then one day God will say, well done, good and faithful servant. And you can take pride in that, in your service to him. As I think about Jesus, especially at Lent, as we focus on his sufferings, I'm reminded of his incredible humility, that he didn't think of himself at all. That his whole reason for coming, his whole life, death, and resurrection wasn't about him at all, but it was about you and me. That God loved us so much he was willing to give himself for us. As you think of that incredible love, I pray that you can just find all your identity and value and meaning there. I pray that you can soak in that love like you soaked 
in a sunny day or in the waves of the ocean. Just be surrounded by and lifted up by and carried by this incredible love of our humble King. It's my prayer that we can give up some pride and receive His love for us. May we be humble enough to receive God's love and to share it with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for this day that you've given to us. And it's entirely a gift. There's nothing at all that I've done to create this day. I've had no power over the sun, the moon, the air. And yet you give us this day because you love us. God, I thank you that you take care of all the things that we need. Even our jobs are a gift from you, and the food in our cupboards is a gift from you. Our vehicles, our houses, our families. God, we're not in control of any of that when it comes right down to it. It's all from you. We thank you for our gifts and our abilities and our talents. And, and often we make those about you, God, but I make it about us, but really it's all about you, that you've uh, taken so much care and creativity in making us all because you love us. And God, we, we thank you for your incredible humility that we see most clearly in Jesus as he, as he steps out of heaven and comes and lives here for us. And God, we thank you for your incredible humility as you send the Holy Spirit to us, to live in us, to work in us and transform us. And, and again, it's just so humbling to think that even your whole mission now on earth is being operated through us. As we carry your word, as we carry your Holy Spirit, as we carry this message of grace and life and salvation and forgiveness to the people around us, God, I pray that more and more we would see that it's not about us, that we wouldn't get puffed up with a sinful pride, but that we would just find all our identity and the love that you give to us, the care that you have for us, and that we could just rest easy in that, knowing that you've made us and that you have great plans for us and in us and through us. God, I pray as we leave here today that we would leave knowing that we're loved, knowing that you care for us, knowing that you are at work in us, knowing that you love us and delight in us. And that should be all the praise that we need. Lord, I pray that you would bless each person here. I pray that you would take care of all the things that they're going through, working on. I pray that you'd be with them in all their uh, successes and all their challenges. We just commit ourselves to you in Jesus. Amen.